So we, in this talk, we're going to talk about uh, why backend for front end is key to your microservices journey. This is specifically a Morningstar's use case. Uh, it's a perspective from a mobile team on how they leverage this architectural pattern. Uh, so before the logistics, please do go and uh, rate this session in the app. Uh, we highly value that. So I want to introduce this, Brian. Uh, hey, so I am the second half of the uh, talk. My name is Brian Grant. Um, I started programming professionally uh, about 2005 and joined Morningstar in late 2012. Um, I have uh, kind of significant contributions to the design and the implementation of the uh, BFF that we're going to be discussing today. Um, and uh, I'm currently a uh, technology manager on Morningstar's uh, individual investor mobile team. And I'm Krishnan Ramanathan. I'm director of engineering at Morningstar. Uh, I've been in the software industry for 18 plus years, coding, leading, uh, managing, and architecting software systems. I'm passionate about microservices, DevOps, AI, and machine learning. So let's get started who we are. Uh, Morningstar uh, at core is an investment research firm. And our mission is to create great products or uh, that help investors reach their financial goals. So when I talk about investors, we have client segments ranging from individual investors like you and me, we have products for them, to uh, clients like financial advisors, to uh, products in retirement space, and also asset management. We spread across 27 countries, and we are roughly 4,200 plus employees. And we are headquartered in Chicago, so we are local. How we serve our clients. So uh, the key to any investment is having access to quality uh, data and making an informed decision using that. So the way we serve clients is providing data as a foundation for us. And then going up the pyramid, we provide value addition on top. So we provide software products uh, and visualization, analytics, and uh, also access to analysts about all investments. Uh, at a higher level of the value proposition, we also provide advice. So we, we do manage uh, investments. We manage the portfolio, both from the investment perspective, also from the retirement, uh, retirement accounts. Let's go to the talk. Back end for front end. Uh, so uh, I took this description from Sam Newman's uh, blog post. He's the author of Building Microservices. He did a great talk yesterday around feature toggle and, uh, and feature branching. It was pretty interesting. So uh, in all, he's also the host of Microservices Track today. So he came up with this description, and he also credits this uh, architectural pattern to Phil Calcaro. So the idea behind uh, this pattern is instead of having a central uh, core backend API, the, you, sh the, uh, you focus more on building a backend for a particular user experience. So in this case, the diagram on the left, we have two backend for frontend. So the desktop client, you build a, have a backend for it. And similarly for your mobile app, you have a backend for that user experience. The diagram on the right is a slight variation of it. You would see that uh, you, you can have a backend for your Android different than a backend experience or, or a user experience for an Android. So basically, you have two separate backends for fronted for your Android and one for your iOS. The key driver to use these patterns is typically, um, you would see the mobile space, you have the, you, you generally tend to have less data. The user experience is slightly different. And also, you, you have um, 
the view specific backend, you, you need a view specific backend to cater for your user experience. So I'm going to walk through our journey, how we started. Probably 10 years back, we had this uh, desktop product which we built, which uh, I would say um, is a key B2B product. I can't disclose the name right now, but uh, it was primarily a BFF. We started off with a BFF at that time. You can also call it a monolith. The whole idea behind that was we, we basically we may have an API layer that caters for all the user experience at the desktop uh, app. And eight years back, what we did is there was a need for developing, launching three more products. So what we did was we stretched the product API and uh, allowed three more products to launch quickly. And, and this was the kind of the uh, design pattern we chose at that time. So it kind of reused the API. We meant to uh, market quicker, but uh, guess what happens? Uh, soon after, the team that built product B, C, and D got dispersed. And then you, you end up in the situation where any change to the core product P now needs kind of a kind of, it becomes very difficult to make those changes because now you're impacting three more products. So that was kind of the uh, case probably eight years back. We, we, even though we were able to reuse, but uh, uh, soon after the maintenance became a problem because any small change impacted all three, four products now. Probably uh, roughly around four years back, what we did was we got our acts together and we applied this BFF concept in building all products. So we, we expanded in two dimensions. One is we added more services. And like if you see here, uh, since we deal with uh, securities, so we build APIs specific to uh, securities. We have APIs specific to um, our real-time data, and we have APIs specific to uh, portfolios, kind of a, a capability-driven or moving towards a more microservices architecture. And at the same time, we also ask product teams to have their own backend. So this kind of a gradual evolution allowed us to kind of um, move towards a more modern architecture. So roughly, uh, tip, what happens typically in, in kind of uh, teams is you have most of the teams that build these services, after two or three years, they realize that, hey, my backend is outdated, the technology is outdated, I want to build a new version of it. So that was, that's what happened for us as well. So a lot of teams, the backend services teams, they started building a new version of their APIs. And, and we kind of, expanded our, uh, our challenges got more. Another version, so now all each product team has to now deal with old API and the new API. So what do we do? So the backend for front-end architecture helped us in this. And you're gonna see more uh, when Brian goes into the detail of how we implement it. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about our mobile journey. So we have eight. Uh, apps on App Store on the iOS side and one app on the Android. So we are more kind of iOS focused right now uh, because of most, based on the user research, we have more iOS users than Android. So uh, in, in my mobile journey, probably five years back, we, the, the key app, uh, all of the eight apps, retail iPad app one of the, was one of the key uh, app for us in the retail segment. So we, uh, there was already a, key, a website, www.morningstar.com, which was a web app at that time. It was a monolith, it was uh, doing many things, and it was serving our desktop users via browser. So what, what, we, what we did was, um, on the get-go, uh, we started off building our mobile app having this mobile service as a BFF layer. 
it was quite natural for us at that time. We didn't know about this pattern at that time. Um, but we, it just fell naturally at that time because the, we couldn't reuse any of the legacy uh, web application. There were some services available at that time, but nothing was reusable because it was very tied to the UI. It was a .NET MVC app at that time. So this is how we started our mobile app journey. So yeah, so we already had BFF to, get, to start with. So, and uh, four years, probably a year later, soon uh, we kind of wanted to build a smartphone user experience. So to get to the smartphone user experience, we, we leveraged uh, the existing BFF. So remember when I described the BFF uh, architecture, there's two variations of it. One is you could have uh, same BFF for both your Android and iOS, or your smartphone, or your um, an iPad, or you could have a separate user experience, a separate backend for front end for a diff for your Android, which is separate than your iOS. So we chose this route uh, because of lot of the benefits we got. So Brian is going to go in deep about talking about this. So now, yeah, I'm going to switch to Brian to go to the implementation. All right. Thanks, Krishan. Uh, so I'm going to spend uh, the first part of my time here talking about some of the, uh, the, the implementation details of this BFF and comes kind of some of the things that we tried to address uh, in, our, in our service. Um, so this service is not just a pass-through for data. It's not just the app uh, calling the service and then getting data out of, uh, out of the data providers. Um, so that's one of the things to consider as I'm talking through here. There's a lot of kind of normalization going on in this service and sort of uh, massaging data and fetching, you know, doing things in a particular way. Um, so, uh, a show of hands for people who've written, uh, read Domain Driven Design by Eric Evans. All right, probably not enough for me to just skip these slides, so I'll go ahead and do them. Um, uh, so, a, uh, in Domain Driven Design, Eric Evans introduces a concept of a bounded context. And um, I'll read the quote in red there at the top. A bounded context delimits the applicability of a particular model so that the team members have a clear and shared understanding of what has to be consistent and how it relates to other contexts. So the benefit of the bounding context in this, in this case is that it creates a space for the team to operate within. Uh, so all of our apps um, have, a, have some similar uh, domain modeling concepts, naming, and that sort of thing, uh, and the BFF helps to maintain that, uh, those relationships. Um, and there are certainly a, you know, there are cases where there's a one-to-one -one relationship between uh, the bounding context that we're operating within and the data uh, that we're consuming from our data providers, but where there are mismatches, the BFF helps to kind of massage that data and transform that data into a space where we're able to use kind of consistent consistent domain modeling within the, both the service and the apps. Um, so a bounded context gives you the flexibility to produce the model that's right for your application. Um, so we have a couple of different cases where uh, I'll call uh, a, a hybrid data model where we have data models represented in the application that actually uh, pull together data from multiple systems. So uh, in, this, uh, in this screenshot here from our smartphone application, um, we have this list of content summaries on the left, and that comes out of one system. And those, uh, the URL thumb, or sorry, the URLs for those thumbnails come out of a different system. So um, it, the BFF kind of pulls that information together and returns that in one uniform, consistent response for the applications to use. And uh, news, news is confusing news. So uh, we consume data from a service, an internal service called News Service. And as anyone would do, uh, we called the stuff coming out of News Service news. And as we're working with the news, uh, we started doing some work with kind of deeper categorization and allowing, um, allowing users to sort of filter uh, into different categories of news. And we started working with um, analysis news and uh, um, video news and commentary news and news news. 
um, which was kind of messy. And, uh, but the fact that we had all this naming and stuff controlled within this bounded context, we were able to do some course correction. Admittedly, it was our problem in the first place. But you know, if we had been you know, dependent on the data provider to sort of correct some of that stuff, it would have been a lot messier than us just sort of changing the names and adjusting APIs and things like that. And naming is hard, and their names are wrong. Um, you know, uh, we all know that naming is hard, and, and it, even when we give it our best try, uh, you know, we get some of that stuff wrong from time to time, and that happens with our data providers as well. Um, and so it's nice to have this space in which you can say, you're like, these name, names don't make sense for us, these models don't make sense for us, so we're gonna sort of reshape that stuff into names and models that, we, uh, that make more sense for us. And, and I mean, honestly, like, who doesn't love like a good Friday afternoon, two hour conversation about you know, naming models? Um, and why would you wanna leave that kind of fun on the table when you could say, hey, uh, so the next kind of general concern that we handle in the BFF is uh, some performance related stuff. Uh, so in terms of uh, caching, we use a distributed in memory cache for a number of different things. Uh, one, of the, one of the main things, uh, a lot of our securities data is reusable across requests. So uh, if you request, um, if you wanna take a look at Morningstar's star rating for Apple and Google, and then I come along and I wanna view that same data, it's not any different for the two of us. So, so we typically lazy load this data into, into our uh, cache. So you know, the request comes in, we check the cache. If it's not there, we go fetch the data from the data provider, stick it back in the cache, and then when that, those next requests come along, we can reuse it from the cache. Uh, we also do some uh, kind of batch, uh, batch processes for sticking stuff in the cache. Um, this is uh, that same, same screen that we were looking at before. The, process for going through this is to, for assembling this list is way more than you'd wanna do in the client side application. Basically, we call one API to get a list of document IDs that we want to display here, and then we have to go to our data provider and make sure that we have access to all of them, because there are some cases where there's either windows where they're not available to us, or, or we're not available, or they'll never be, never be available to us. So we wanna make sure that we're not throwing stuff up in the app that a user is not going to actually be able to tap on and read, uh, and then we stitch a couple of other things together, stick that stuff in the cache, and then when the apps call for this data, call the API for this data, it just comes right out of the cache. So we're doing some some of the heavier heavier lifting that just wouldn't be pragmatic to do in a, in especially in multiple applications. Uh, we use HTTP cache headers a uh, fair bit. Um, again, kind of reusable stuff, the same stuff that we would be st uh, storing in the server side uh, in memory cache. We would put HTTP cache headers on for, you know, for uh, reusability there. And then uh, private cache control headers. So if I wanna look at my portfolio of securities, that's private data for me, but the app can store that in its local cache, and if I'm you know, moving around in the app and I come back to that view, and the view wants to refresh it, it's stored in the local, the local HTTP cache, and so it doesn't need to fetch all that data again. Um, so I'm gonna take a brief detour from the discussion of, uh, of um, performance to talk about REST. Um, let's just take a minute. You could turn to somebody who's next to you uh, or you could break up into smaller groups and uh, just discuss, see if you can come up with a definition of what a REST service looks like. Just, I'll give you like 45 seconds. You can talk amongst yourselves. All right, maybe about 10 more seconds. <laughs> All right. 
I'm glad to see that no fist fights broke out over that, uh, over that discussion. D does anybody, maybe anybody want to share the definition they came up with? All right. Uh, uh, yes, go ahead. Okay, all right, yeah, use of HTTP, uh, HTTP verbs and CRUD names and that kind of thing. All right. Um, so this is a bit of a trick question uh, because there's the, the, the discussion around what REST is and how you do it and whether you're doing it right is, uh, is so convoluted at times, like two minutes would never be enough. I mean, we could probably spend half a day talking about it from the discussions that, I, that, you, that I've been a part of at least. Um, so if you have a strong opinion on REST, uh, I'm, this is a warning. I'm going to talk about rest a little bit. Uh, you may not agree with the words that I use or the way I describe rest. Um, that probably doesn't make me a bad person. And you know, even if we disagree, um, I'm otherwise pretty easy to get along with. And you know, I just think you know, let's not let this kind of a, a disagreement prevent us from becoming lifelong friends. Okay. So um, as, we were build, as we were building our BFF service, we, we tried to uh, adopt a number of different kind of restful architecture principles. Uh, and this, uh, this uh, Richardson maturity model was sort of our guiding, guiding light with respect to our implementation. Um, Martin Fowler has a really good blog post on discussing this model and sort of picking apart the different stages and talking about some of the, some of the pros and cons. Um, but uh, the basic idea is that you, you know, adopt these different stages and you ob obtain, I'm not, the glory of rest. So we're not, we're not there yet. I don't know what happens when you get there. Maybe you, you know, cease to exist from this plane of existence or I, I don't know. Uh, I'll let you know when we get there. Um, so, uh, so just a couple of comments on the way we sort of leverage these ideas in our, in our BFF. Uh, so level one in the Richardson maturity model is, uh, is use of resources. So if you want to address a resource, there's sort of a, a contextual path to getting there, including you know, names of groups of resources plus the resource IDs. Um, so if you want a information about a security, can you see the pointer? Okay. Um, or quotes or articles for security, you can use a path like this with the security ID. And similarly, if you're a customer and you want access to your holdings for a particular portfolio, you would use a, a URI like this. Uh, level two, HTTP verbs, indeed. Um, so these are kind of the ones that we make the most use of. Any use, any uh, options users in the house? No. Options, all right, okay, yeah? All right, yeah, can't forget about options because nobody knows that it exists. Um, so, and uh, then it's kind of the big one, level three is the use of hypermedia controls. Hypermedia controls are generally links embedded in the server response, um, telling the client maybe what actions they can perform on a given, uh, a given resource. So if I fetch a resource, there would be links in there saying, you know, am I allowed to delete it? Am I allowed to make changes to it? That kind of a thing. Um, and also, uh, links for associated data. So if I'm pulling down one piece of information and there's maybe three or four other associated pieces of data, there would be links to those telling me you know, how, how I'm able to access those particular resources. So the name for this is uh, Hypermedia as the, engine, as the Engine of Application State or Hattios or Hattios or however you want to pronounce that. I'm not gonna pick a fight about the pronunciation. Um, we use this very, very little, so we have not ascended to the glory of rest, and I'll come back and talk, to, talk a little bit about kind of where this fits in in our BFF journey. Oh, and then we use some, um, try to generally use uh, HTTP headers uh, and response, uh, response codes, and we use a little bit of custom headers here and there. And we use some uh, generalized endpoints, and, and I'll talk about this in, a, in the coming slides. So we now return you to our regularly scheduled program. So one of the performance concerns that, we try, that we've worked to address in our APIs, our BFF APIs, is to reduce the chattiness of the client application. So basically, where there's an opportunity for us to kind of 
ship off a whole bunch of data that makes sense in a particular view will do that. Um, so I would call these kind of like view specific APIs. So if, if you look in a strict, in a more strict restful approach, um, you might, if you're looking for information on your holdings, you might get an array of holding objects with associated links for additional security data, additional quote data. So then it's the client, client application's job to say, you know, if you've got 50 securities in this, or 50 holdings here, to make the next 100 requests um, to fetch that data. But because we know what the views look like in these applications, um, we, have t we have tended to build, in some cases, these more kind of view-specific APIs. So instead of including all those links, um, we would embed the security data and the quote data and whatever, whatever other kind of associated data uh, right in the response. So the client doesn't have to be making all those additional round trips for the information that we know that it needs for, that, for those views anyway. Um, the, in some of our more generalized APIs, we, we do, we're a finance company, we do a lot of stuff with market data and, and uh, securities, stocks, that kind of stuff. Uh, we've updated or we, uh, we've written our security related M and uh, APIs to support multiple security IDs. So it's fairly common for a view to, sh you know, show information about multiple securities at a time if you want to compare, you know, two or three different securities and their performance and how Morningstar has rated them, that sort of thing. Um, the client application could, could simply make a request for, if I want the quotes, a comma-separated list of Apple and Google and Facebook. And then the, uh, the last kind of performance related thing, uh, again, because we're, we're trying to use the BFF service to do as much of the heavy lifting for the applications as we can, uh, we do a lot of, uh, try to make use of parallelism and asynchronous operations wherever we can. Um, this, uh, so we use the, uh, the play framework. Any play framework users in the house? All right, good, one over there. Um, so uh, Play has a really, really nice API for doing asynchronous, uh, asynchronous operations. And this is sort of a pseudo Cody example of one, one that we do today. Um, we have a, basically an API where um, you want to send, the client wants to send a request for a number of different securities and get back one piece of Morningstar analysis, Morningstar commentary, third party news, and Morningstar video. Um, the problem is that our data providers and support querying like this. We, so, so what we end up having to do is for every security, we fire off four of these requests asynchronously, um, and then the, the uh, frameworks APIs help us to you know, kind of let us know when all that data is available and, and, uh, and then act on it when, when it's ready. Um, so then we collect all the stuff into these promise objects and it allows us to say, you know, if I'm asking for this information for, you know, a dozen different securities, we can fire these requests off uh, in batches of four for, you know, for each of these securities. So, so, you know, doing a lot of that heavy lifting that would be fairly onerous to deal with on the client side, especially across, uh, especially across multiple applications has been a, a big benefit for us. Um, so the last uh, implementation topic I'm going to talk about is error handling. And I'm going to use a rather cool term I think is cool from Eric Evans. Uh, this is the, the anti-corruption layer. Um, so I'm just going to read the quote here. Uh, but when the other side of the boundary starts to leak through, the translation layer may take on a more defensive tone. Um, so domain-driven design is, is about um, business modeling, domain modeling, naming, consistency, that kind of stuff. Um, but when you work with, uh, especially when you work with lots of different data providers, you know, a lot of different styles of responses and that kind of thing, you really need to think kind of at a core level about your error handling strategy and how you're going to be, uh, you know, you, and you probably want to build that kind of stuff into your modeling. Uh, so, Sun Microsystems told us the network is the computer, um, and I'm telling you that the network is a bag of angry cats. 
Um, that's uh, that I think you know working in a distributed distributed environment, you see all these weird things, you know, network problems when you're talking with one data provider, and and you know who knows what they're doing behind the scenes to get the data that you're asking for. So lots of room for failure. Uh, so we ended up building this kind of uh, custom web service integration layer. You could kind of think of it as like a, a DAO for web service calls if you're into DAOs, um, where we basically, excuse me, handle a lot of boilerplate error handling, timeouts, things like that, um, so that we're, you're, we're sort of uh, capturing these potential problems that we, that we would get with you know, interacting with different data service providers. So, and of course, because the different data, data, data service providers have different styles of error handling our, themselves, we kind of normalize that stuff. So, you know, we have a, quite a few of them that do standard HTTP code responses that we can look at very easily. Um, everybody loves this one. Everything, the HTTP header tells you that everything's okay, but then you look at the response body and as it turns out, everything's not okay. Um, and then other weird corner cases where you called a JSON API and you get redirected to an HTML page. Um, it happens, not very often, fortunately. Um, and then so with respect to our API's responses to our client applications, we've kind of standardized on a few different, uh, you know, few HTTP uh, response, response types. Uh, partial content is interesting if we've got, um, you know, let's say the Client application asks for one thing, and under the covers, we're maybe calling two different data providers and stitching that information together. But you know, if part of that information doesn't return for whatever reason, we would use 206, 206 to say, hey, you asked for this. I didn't get all of it, but I'm giving you what I was able to get. Um, and the, the, other, the other two that are interesting to highlight are 503. Basically, if we make a call to a data, data provider and something goes wrong, they're down, they timed out, they gave us HTML when we went to JSON, that kind of stuff, then we return a 503 to our client applications and then that's just kind of built into the contract of how we're, you know, how the client applications are consuming these. This is sort of a signal is like, something went wrong, not our fault, try again later kind of a thing. Um, and it's worth drawing attention to the fact that we never produce 500 errors uh, or 500 results um, intentionally. Those are reserved for our programming mistakes and null pointer exceptions and things like that. So if our APIs are returning 500s, we know we've got some serious problem to address because we're, we're basically falling over. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, lessons learned. Um, these are you know, lessons learned from building this uh, BFF from, uh, from uh, supporting multiple client applications over the years. So, um, you know, you build a system, you build a, a service, and every once in a while you find, you know, especially as we're all talking about microservices, like, oh, microservices are cool. Um, am I a monolith? Should I be a monolith? Like, am I concerned about that kind of stuff? What can I split off and be, uh, be more microservicey? Um, so we've definitely run into some situations where, where we realize we built some stuff into our service that doesn't really belong there. Like the most, I think the most uh, obvious example is that um, when somebody buys a subscription to Morningstar data through our iPad app, that goes to the Apple store, they send their information to one of our systems internally, and then that system actually talks through us, through our BFF, back to Apple doesn't belong there. It's, uh, it doesn't really fit into that service. It's still there today. We'll probably you know, break that out as a separate service in the future. But it's one of those things that you know, when we look at that service, we kind of scratch our heads and go, yeah, why do we do that? Um, and it, you know, we've built a number of different applications on, uh, on this BFF. Three of them are very, very similar experiences. And so like, it doesn't, f I, I think the the general idea of the BFF pattern holds for those different experiences, um, but when we've built other applications or when we're thinking about building other applications, it's a question of like, should we do this? Should we spin this off as something else? Should we you know, break this into a separate service and have those services call each other? Um, but that, you know, those are just conversations that we've had uh, over time when we're building new things. 
Uh, and then there's the inevitable question, as Krishnan mentioned, about this question of reuse by other teams. Uh, we've we'd been approached by a couple of different teams over the years about, you know, hey, we want to use your service because you have this nice integration with these secure uh, data providers for securities data. It's consistent. You did the work already. Um, uh, can we just use it? Uh, and and we kind of decided to draw a line in the sand and say, you know, we we don't want to support that. We don't want to. We want to be able to make changes to this how, that are right for our application and not be, you know, burdened by supporting a bunch of other products. But the application's in source control. You're free to fork it and you know take a take a, a whack at building something with it if you want. Um, a, the uh, the BFF has been a really great place to buffer change. Um, so because we have a number of different applications, uh, mobile applications, you know, if we need, if we want to, or we need to cut over to a new uh, service provider, if we're adding data or subtracting data or moving data around in our modeling and that kind of thing, um, the 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 uh, the BFF service is kind of a one-stop shop for you know, managing that change rather than having to, you know, make ch changes in four different apps and try to get those out to app stores and, and in, in a timely fashion. Uh, and because we control the release schedule on that BFF, we can kind of do, we can kind of do the, introduce those changes whenever we want to do that. So if there's a, you know, if somebody's deprecating an API next week, we can, or, uh, you know, we can build, build kind of a, a bridge feature today and deploy that and then when, when, things, you know, when things make that formal transition, we just handle it on the back end. Um, and uh, helping client-side developers move faster is, is kind of an interesting one. Um, so when we're building new APIs, of course, in a lot of cases, if we're integrating with a new data provider or something like that, either the work has to be done in the BFF service or the work may have to be done in the data provider service as well. So you know, there's lag time there until all that work gets done before the client developers can build you know, their features and that kind of thing. So what we've, what we've ended up doing in numerous cases is just adding stub data to our BFF service. So um, you know, agreeing on an API contract between the server and client side developers, what this data needs to look like, you know, just stub some data out that the client side developers can begin working with uh, immediately and then in the best case scenarios, which is admittedly not all of the scenarios, um, when that work on the BFF side integration with the data provider is done, the real data just starts flowing through and you know, somebody picks the app up in QA one day and sees real data instead of the stub data. Um, one of the, I mentioned this, this balance of general purpose APIs and view specific APIs. I feel like we've done a reasonably good job of that. Um, I think when we, when we start building a new API, we're generally, we're, we're thinking about it as we want this to be as general purpose as we can. Because we're supporting a number of different applications, um, it's kind of like, well, even if, it's, even if this application needs to use this this way today, it would be good to, to build this in a relatively general way so that you know, if this other app wants to use it tomorrow, it can just call these same endpoints and, and get the same data. Um, and yeah, I mentioned the, uh, the view specific API. So that's, uh, we do yeah, try, to, try to do a little bit less of that. And be, yeah, we have a number of different experiences using these APIs. So I said I would come back to KDOs, KDOs, like Cheerios. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Right. Explaining the joke always makes the joke better. <laughs> um, so, uh, as I said, we have not achieved the uh, the glory of rest. We're not using uh, we're not using hypermedia very extensively at all. Um, where we have used it, I think we're really glad that we did, uh, and we definitely see that. Um, we've, I think we've made some mistakes um, where if we'd used it more, there wouldn't be quite so much client-side application logic where, you know, oh, I got this data, I know how to pick one of these 
data points and build a URL out of it and get some additional data. So the client applications are all sort of, you know, they all have this logic sprinkled throughout. So if we use this approach a little bit more, then I think, you know, it, we would have a little bit less, less of that stuff. And if we want to move data, if we want to move or migrate data within these APIs, then, then those would just be server side changes because the client wouldn't really know or care where that specific data would come from. It just has to know to call an API. Um, and so kind of back to sort of close off that restful conversation. Um, some people would say that if you're not using Hadios, you're not restful. And that's fine. I don't know if I'm not, you know, super, uh, uh, super committed to whether or not we're restful. Um, I think that approach and requiring that approach maybe makes a bit more sense for generalized, you know, more general purpose APIs. But um, in this BFF service, taking a more sort of pragmatic approach, um, you know, it doesn't hurt me if, if, you know, we get together afterwards and say, you know, this service is not restful. It's, uh, it, it's worked well for us and, uh, and you know, um, it's, it, yeah. We're, we're, ta we're tailored too specifically to our client applications, I think, to make heavy use of this or to insist that we use it in, in, in all of our APIs. Uh, so I want to open the floor up to some Q&A. Right, so the question is, did we, where, where we drew the line for reuse? Was it the, just with the BFF or the gateway API as well? So, so yeah, the, the BFF is, is really our, our gateway API. So our, um, our, our mobile applications are calling the BFF service, and that is, you know, kind of, uh, you know, a, a, a gateway API as well. So that's the, the application's gateway to all this data. Is that it's, it's different than the API gateway we talk about uh, in Amazon or oh, any yes. other, which is, or that's we true. do have uh, our own, uh, API gateway called Apigee we use within our data center. So that's, uh, that's kind of a uh, cross-cutting, uh, it's a gateway for all of our backend services, but uh, this BFF is different, that it's, it connects right. directly, it's very closely tied to the user experience, which is the client apps. Right, so the question is, do we find ourselves duplicating, basically duplicating stuff in the BFF that basically, the, there's sort of a one-to-one -one relationship between uh, between the BFF APIs and the data provider APIs. Um, I don't think there have been too many of those. So there, there, have been, there have been some, and, that is, and that's kind of the, even in cases where, where we have done that, I, there's enough of this kind of uh, um, consistent error handling, consistent uh, response, um, you know, standardization, where I think that we get we've the client application development has been benefits from that kind of stuff. I think. Thank you guys. Yeah.